Good morning, North Hills. Happy Easter to you all. We are excited and ready to worship with you this morning. So let's praise God as we declare that the stone was rolled away and he is risen. Sing this together. Out of the shadows, bound for the gallows, a dead man walking to love.
stone was moved for good, for the lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, and the Spirit. Happy Easter. Um, we are going to start with our the traditional Easter greeting, which is when I'll say, he is risen, and then you're going to respond so loud that I can hear you through your t TV, he is risen indeed. So let's do that. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I hope you said it. Um, that is known as the Pascal greeting. Um, it's a very old greeting in the history of the church, actually. Um, the church has been doing this. Actually, we don't know when it started, but it goes back. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Western Church all do it. Um, Pascal means Passover, so it's tied to the Passover. And um, it's a really, it goes back probably, there's probably two origins, I think. One is um, on the road to the Emmaus, when Jesus revealed himself to the two disciples walking, they came back to the other disciples and said they saw Jesus. And um, the, it doesn't say who said it, but the other disciples responded back to them and said, the Lord has risen indeed. He has appeared to Simon. And so that's one of the ways they think it, it, it came about. Um, and the other actually is by Mary Magdalene. And the, as tradition goes, and this is through the Eastern Orthodox tradition, that Mary Magdalene went to Rome and um, under Emperor Tiberius, she was being questioned and she said, Jesus, uh, Christ is risen. And so this has been going on um, at least for thousands, over a thousand years. Um, it goes back and the church on Easter Sunday has said this. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And this he is risen is in the present tense. It's not something that he was risen and now has died. He is risen. He continues to be risen. And so um, today, let's do that again. He is risen. I still didn't hear you. Let's try one more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. So today we celebrate Easter. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Um, if you haven't yet and you, and you would like to, please fill out your connection card. We'd love to have any prayer requests, comments, um, just your name so we can see that you were here this morning on Easter morning. And we'd love, to, we'd love to hear from you in that way. And then if you have tithes and offerings, uh, you can just send it to our P.O. box. You'll see the address here pop up. I have one announcement, and that is on April 18th at 2 o'clock here at CBC, we will be holding um, an, indoor, or an, an outdoor gathering, and it'll be following what we've been doing the last few months. Uh, we'll meet outdoors. Uh, there will be kids program, sermon, and worship. And so, um, he is risen. I hope you said it. Well, let's pray, and we'll move on to the sermon. Lord, we are grateful to celebrate your resurrection. In fact, without your resurrection, all we do as Christians just doesn't make any sense. Um, we're people of resurrection. And so today we commit ourselves to that afresh today. We recognize your resurrection today again. We celebrate it again. And Lord, we want to be people who live in, your, in the new life of your resurrection each day. We commit ourselves to this today, Jesus. And in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, happy Easter, everyone. 
I'm so glad to be with you this morning on Easter Sunday. This is, in my line of work, the best day of the year. This is why we're. This is the reason why we exist as a church. Of course, today we are here because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. We are here because God resurrected Jesus from the tomb. And over these past eight weeks, we've been learning about the story of Jesus from the Gospel of Mark. And uh, if you're at all familiar with the story of Jesus' uh, crucifixion and his burial, you may know that Jesus, um, when he was crucified on the cross, there were many, many people who were witnesses to that particular event. Uh, Not only just the disciples, but uh, Mary, Jesus' mother, was there. Um, There were you know, other eyewitnesses, of course, Roman soldier was there. There's also a, a particular group of women that were there who are followers of Jesus. Uh, one name you'll recognize, Mary Magdalene. She was there, and there was another Mary. Her name was, they called her Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, whoever those two are. And then there was another woman named Salome, whoever she was. We don't know who she was. And um, these three women, uh, Mark tells us, stood there and, and you know, tried as best they can to, to encourage, comfort, uh, support Jesus at that time. Um, they were also at the place where Jesus was laid to rest at the tomb when a wealthy religious leader named uh, Joseph from a town called Arimathea, wherever that is, um, gave his tomb up for Jesus. And the story of Easter, as we know, begins with this tragic death that Jesus experiences. But the tragedy isn't simply just bad news. The tragedy is the gospel. It's the good news. The tragedy becomes the saving work of God for all humanity. Jesus dies on the cross for the sins of the world. And the Bible tells us all of that took place on a Friday, just before sundown, just before the Sabbath began. And this man, Joseph from Arimathea, he sees all of this taking place and he decides to take Jesus' body and put it in a tomb. He takes Jesus' body down from the cross, wraps it in linen, and puts it in a tomb, his tomb, his family's tomb. Now, the three women that I mentioned, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and Salome, they were all there to help in this. They were all there to witness this. Because preparing a body for a burial is really, really important in ancient Judaism. You want to make sure you treat that body with tremendous respect. You uh, ritually cleanse the body, and then you shroud it. Now, unfortunately, Jesus' burial seemed to take place in a hurry. It was rushed. They were not able to do what needed to be done. And so Mark tells us a little insight to what happens next. And this is Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. It says, Saturday evening, when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. Very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. On the way, they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But as they arrived, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked, but the angel said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there, just as he told you before he died. The women fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered, and they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. At the end of the story there. In fact, that's how Mark ends. The book ends that way. Comes to an end. It's the final, this is the final story in this gospel. Now, when is an ending not the end? Riddle me this, Batman. When is the ending not the end? A pastor I know had gotten himself in a little bit of trouble one time while speaking at a conference that I I was attending this conference at the time, and he said kind of a controversial thing, and it created a little you know, noise within the audience that was there. People were a little disgruntled and booing him. And I'll never forget him uh, coming back and responding with this particular line. 
He said, I might be done, but I'm not finished. And I have never forgotten that line. I, I think it was like 20 years ago when I heard it. I thought, that's a keeper. I don't even know what the controversy was about, but I know that line. I'm not done. Well, I might be done, but I'm not finished. Anyway, these three women who witnessed Jesus' death and burial are the first people to encounter Jesus' resurrection. Now, the night before all of this took place, these women had gathered up items that they would need to, in order to give Jesus a proper burial. They got perfumes, they got ointments and so on, and they, this would have happened sometime after 6 p.m. on Saturday night. Then the, the text tells us that very early the next morning, Sunday morning, just as the sun is peeking up on the horizon, they make their way to the tomb. Now, it's just the three of them. Where, where is everybody else? In fact, where are the disciples at this moment? Where's that group of men that Jesus poured his life into, that Jesus taught and mentored and discipled? Where are they? This is very striking. None of Jesus' closest disciples, none of the 12 are going with them. It's just these three women. Now, maybe the disciples thought it was too risky. You know, Jesus had been arrested two days before and, you know, crucified on the cross. Maybe they thought, oh, that could happen to us, so they run. But seriously, where are they? I mean, they had been with Jesus nonstop for three years and they're not here on this day to pay respect to him, to help in the burial process. It's just so amazing to think. Now, these women are paying respect. These women who, by the way, play kind of a minor role in the story of Jesus. In fact, appear here, you know, at the end of the story. But they play a very significant part in his burial, in his crucifixion, in his burial, and his resurrection. These women had set out to honor and serve Jesus just one more time by giving him a more formal burial. However, they hadn't thought things completely through, as you see in the story where they're walking on the way and they're thinking to themselves, uh-oh, who's going to roll away the stone when we get there? Now, back in those days, the stones typically were, they were squared off that covered tombs. And you can kind of imagine a, a large square stone. And it would make sense to make it that way because it'd be harder to roll away, right? If you were a wealthy person, which Joseph of Arimathea was, you would have a giant stone in front of your tomb. I mean, five, six feet tall. It weighed hundreds and hundreds of pounds. And it would be round because it would be easier to roll in front of the, the opening of the tomb. But then it would drop in and then it would be really hard not impossible, but hard to get back out and back open. So they're wondering, how are we going to get in? And I guess I, they, perhaps they just think, well, we'll figure it out when we get there, because you know people like that. They'll just figure it out when they get there. Anyway, a tomb in those days was usually big enough to hold more than one body. Around the time Jesus uh, lived, tombs were usually uh, designed to help the body decay in such a way so that then later on, months later, more, more like years later, somebody would come along, scoop up all the bones, and put those bones now in a bone box, which is called an ossuary, and they would bury that box. I remember when Terry and I were in Jerusalem, it was one of the most surreal moments. We visited the tomb where they think Jesus was laid to rest. And there's a church built over the top of the tomb, the, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And they must have had like half off tickets for that day because there were so many people visiting uh, that at that time. The line was so long, it would take hours for us to visit, to go into Jesus' tomb, and we didn't have the time for it. So it was a little discouraging. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this lady says to us, hey, you know, this, this big old church here has other tombs in it. I mean, they're probably pretty much the same when you think. And so we thought, yeah, where are they? So she pointed us in the direction. And so we went to visit one of these tombs. And it was quite striking. First of all, it was very dark in there. And you'd go in, you'd have to duck down and go under, you know, and then you come into this like cave thing. And we all had our, uh, our flashlights on our cell phones to see because there was no light inside there. And, you know, you're inside this really a cave. And you come in and there's this 
you know, sort of, I don't want to say large area, but, a, but there's enough space, you know, inside. There's a circular space or whatever. And then to stand and do stuff if you need to. And then on the wall to our right side were two openings, large openings, large enough to lay a full-size body in. And I got to admit, it was a little creepy looking in there thinking about this, but I did think for a moment, this would make a really cool haunted house. I'm not lying. But anyway, that, this was the tomb that we were looking at, and this is possibly what Jesus may have laid in. And these three ladies are wondering, how are we going to get into that tomb? Because there's this giant stone in front of it. But as they approach, they see that the stone has already been rolled away. The tomb is wide open now. Now, Mark never tells us who rolled away the stone, but the implication is, of course, that some divine intervention took place. God has done this one. This is the work of God here. Now, when they enter the tomb, they expect to see Jesus' body laying inside, just like they saw it when they left it on Friday. They were not expecting to see a man dressed in white clothes sitting inside the tomb. Now, Mark never tells us who this young man is, but we're guessing he's angelic. And they are, they are completely stunned. Stone rolled away. Jesus isn't there. And then you got this angelic being dressed like Liberace sitting inside of there. What is happening? What's going on? And of course, the angelic figure realizes they are confused. So he says to them, Jesus, the Nazarene, having been crucified, he's not here. He has risen. Look, this is where they placed him. And then, of course, the women were like, yeah, we were here on Friday. We saw where he was placed. Now, it's easy kind of rush to an explanation of the resurrection and all that kind of stuff and miss one important statement that that angelic being said to those women. Jesus, having been crucified, Jesus died. And Jesus was buried in, placed in that tomb as a dead man. He wasn't knocked unconscious. He died. And the women knew this. They were there at his crucifixion. And they were there at his burial, and now they are there at his tomb, and he is missing. And they're wondering, where has he gone? And the angelic figure says, he is risen. He is alive. The body has been resurrected. And this, of course, without a doubt, is God's doing. God is involved in this. When is an ending, not the end? when there is a resurrection from the dead. And the first people to hear the news of this resurrection are three women, three women. Now, this is so remarkable because at this time in you know, history, women, especially in that area and location, were not considered to be reliable witnesses. In fact, they were ineligible to testify some Jewish writings on the issue of women were so chauvinistic, claiming that women lacked common knowledge in order to be a witness of any kind. And perhaps some women in our day would say, not much has changed, where men are still having problems believing women. In the early days of the church, in the early days of Christianity, there were actually people in the church who wanted to change the story on who the first people to hear about Jesus' resurrection was. They thought the original story was embarrassing. A group of women? They, didn't, they thought people won't take this story seriously. We need to change it. But there's a great irony in all of this. And that is this, that women being the first to get the news actually makes the story far more credible. The early Christians would never have invented a story like this unless it was factual. As Dorothy Sayers once noted, it's no wonder that women were the first at the cradle and last at the cross because they had never met a man like this man. Now, after trying to assure the women that Jesus is alive, the angelic being instructs the women to go and tell the disciples that Jesus is risen. And I don't know if you pick this up, Peter gets singled out. 
tell especially Peter. Now, Peter, no doubt, is singled out because he is he so dramatically and so emphatically denied Jesus three different times. So Jesus wants to meet up with him in Galilee. There is forgiveness, Peter. And we know from the other Gospels that once the disciples learn about the resurrection here and that the tomb is empty, they come running to the tomb to investigate it for themselves. Peter is the first person to step inside and to realize Jesus is risen. You know, sometimes the message of Easter is for the ones who have either walked away or lost their way. When is the ending, not the end? When you've made an epic failure, but recognize that there is forgiveness. When your marriage ends in a divorce. When your friendship is broken. When a trust has been betrayed. The ending does not have to be the end. You might be done, but you are not finished. You lose your job. You bankrupt, lose a house. The end does not have to be the end. Even when death reaches our doorstep, the ending is not the end. For as Jesus told us that he is the resurrection and the life, anyone who puts their trust in him will live even when they die. The ending is not the end. Now, the angelic uh, being instructs the women to tell the disciples that Jesus wants to meet them in Galilee. Now, again, if you're familiar and you've been with us throughout this series in Mark, you know that Galilee, Galilee is the hometown here. This is where everybody was really from. This is where Jesus met his disciples. This is where the headquarters was. This is really where it all got started. And for those disciples, they thought Jesus' death was the end of the story. The end of a remarkable experience with an amazing teacher, with an amazing leader. But it wasn't the end. They were just getting started. They are not finished. Now, the reunion in Galilee would launch one of the most remarkable movements in the history of the world. Jesus would instruct his disciples to go into all the world and to tell this story. And they did. And today, we are a part of that movement, part of Jesus' gathering, part of the church. So when is the ending not the end? When the church continues to gather, even if it's during a pandemic, whether on YouTube or in a park somewhere, we are not finished. Because God is not finished. You might feel like you're done, but you're not finished because Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. Would you pray with me? Let's pray together. Lord God, this is the story of your death and burial and resurrection that becomes the gospel story. This is the event that took place in history meant to save our lives, save our souls, save us as people, to redeem us. That Lord, even though we are flawed people and we have sinned and made tremendous mistakes throughout our lives, we know that that part of us is not the, the ending that you resurrect us, you renew us, you save us, redeem us. And we are forever grateful for that, forever grateful that you have risen, that you have risen indeed. And so we offer ourselves to you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, amen. Happy Easter, North Hills. Happy Easter. Paid it all. 
And I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all, cause Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, Sin to you all. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Go in peace.